A huge welcome to everyone who's joining us today for this Natural History Live webinar, Making Space for Great Crested Newts, the District Level Licensing Scheme. I'm really excited to hand over to Rachel Davies from Lancashire Wildlife Trust. Brilliant. Thanks, Alan. Um, hi, everyone. Um, as Alan said, I'm Rachel. I joined the Lancashire Wildlife Trust in February this year, and I work solely on the district level licensing scheme, which I'm going to tell you about in a bit more detail. I am just going to switch my video off um, because I've also had internet problems, so hopefully that will help. Um, and I'm just going to share my screen with you all. Brilliant. Um, I trust that you can all see that. Um, if at any point my audio uh, stops working, if somebody could just let me know, that would be fantastic. Um, so to start, I just wanted to share this bit of text from the Freshwater Habitats Trust. So a pond can be defined as a body of water which can vary in size between one square metre and two hectares. Two hectares is equivalent in size to about 2.5 football pitches. So it might be larger than what you'd usually think of when you think of a pond. Um, ponds also don't need to hold water for the full year. So um, as long as they're holding water for four months of the year, then they class as a pond. So in our minds, we might have this image of this beautiful, small little body of water that's quite full. Um, but ponds are much more complex than that. Um, another quote I love, also from the Freshwater Habitats Trust, is that ponds support two thirds of all freshwater species in the UK. And that is actually quite amazing. If you think about all the different types of freshwater we have, the fact that ponds are supporting two thirds of all freshwater species is just unbelievable. Um, but ponds are special for a number of other reasons as well. Um, so one of the first things is that they provide shelter for wildlife, and that can be a wide range of wildlife depending on the vegetation growing around the pond. Um, they provide a breeding habitat for many amphibian species. They provide drinking water for terrestrial wildlife, such as hedgehogs and foxes. They provide drinking water for birds, and they also provide bathing water for birds. And because of the number of invertebrates found within ponds, they also provide a fantastic feeding habitat for many different species. So ponds are really, really incredibly special places. Um, but unfortunately, they have been in dramatic decline in the UK, um, and we are suffering a lot of ponds through habitat loss. Um, so part of the district level licensing scheme is trying to bring ponds back to our landscape. Um, before I start talking about district level licensing, I just want to start by talking about the Great Crested Newt, who is really the star of the show when it comes to DLL. Um, so Great Crested Newts are our largest newt species in the UK. Um, we do have two other newt species, the Palmain Newt and the Smooth Newt, but they are both much smaller. Uh, Great Crested Newts have a black body and they're covered in a distinctive warty skin. So um, when we're looking at adult newts, it can often be fairly simple to tell a Great Crested Newt apart from our other two newt species. But when they're juveniles, it can be really tricky. So looking for that distinctive warty skin can really help. Um, on adult Great Crested Newts, their underside is orange and they have large black blotches on their belly. And on the underside of their chin, um, it, it's also orange and they have lots of really small black dots clustered together. And both of these are key identification features for the Great Crested. Um, one really interesting fact is that Great Crested Newts can actually be identified to individual level by the patterning on their underside. So it's really similar to our fingerprint. Their pattern is specific to that one newt. So if you take photos of the patterning, you can then go back year on year and see if the exact same newt is there. And that's pretty cool. Um, during breeding season, uh, great crested newts do change their appearance. So males develop a long wavy crest along their back and they have a white flash along their tail. And this is quite distinctive. They almost look like little prehistoric dragons. Um, females don't develop a crest, but they do have an orange flash along their tail, which is um, quite an obvious feature. 
So on this slide, um, we've got a male on the left and that male is in his full breeding colours. You can see his crest and you can see that white and then orange flash on his tail. On the right, we have a female. Now she's not in breeding colours, but what you can see really clearly in this image is that distinctive warty skin. You can see the texture and that's really useful. Um, if we just look back at the male, um, you can see the orange coloration on his underside and those large black blotches on his belly. And then on his chin, you can see that like dappling with black spots and both of them are key. Um, so to understand why we do the district level licensing scheme the way we do, it's important to know about the Great Crested Newt life cycle. So as with many amphibians, they return to water during uh, spring to breed and for great crested newts specifically between March and June. During uh, breeding season, males will display, they'll do a courtship display to the females um, to attract them. And after mating, females will lay up to 200 eggs. Uh, the females take a lot of care with their eggs and they'll actually lay each one individually on the leaves of aquatic vegetation and then they'll take the time to roll the leaf around the egg to offer it some protection. Eggs um, are in the water between two to four weeks depending on environmental conditions and then the larvae hatch. Larvae spend time growing within the pond and um, they'll grow their front legs first and then their back legs. And that's a little bit unusual because a lot of our amphibians will do back legs first and then front legs. Um, larvae leave the pond uh, between August and October. Again, it depends on environmental conditions. Um, but once they've left the pond, they'll begin to live and feed terrestrially. And at this stage of their life, they're known as Fs. Um, Fs spend all of autumn feeding terrestrially and then they'll hibernate through winter. And then the following year, um, they will continue feeding and growing and it's normally between two to four years before they are able to breed. And um, so I've just got a little video now to show you um, a breeding display by a male and some egg laying by a female because it's really fascinating. My video isn't going to work so Dan is just about to share his with us. It is egg laying time for one of our rarest amphibians, the great crested newt. Like the lamprey, mating is triggered by the spring rise in water temperature. The courting male, looking like a prehistoric reptile with crest raised, fans his coloured tail to impress his intended mate. The female is also enticed by pheromone scents wafted over her by the male who finally deposits a sperm package on the bottom of the pond. The female picks up his genetic parcel in a vent at the base of her tail. With a final flourish, the male withdraws, his genetic code successfully transmitted. The female then selects a suitable water plant on which to lay the first of her precious eggs. Clasping its stem with all four limbs, she rolls it carefully in the underside of a leaf. In time, each will hatch into a tiny newt tadpole, which one day may grow into the likeness of its flamboyant father. Brilliant, thank you very much for that. Perfect. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Great Crested Newts and district level licensing. Um, so it's important to understand um, that Great Crested Newts are a protected species. So although they are relatively common and widespread in the UK, their numbers have been declining in the last 60 years and their distribution is becoming patchy. The UK population is one of the better ones in Europe and because of that we are ha we have a significantly an internationally significant population so what we do with our newts in the UK is really important and um, they are protected under UK legislation and they're also protected under European legislation which means it's illegal to kill capture injure or disturb a great crested newt unless you are licensed to do so 
It is also illegal to disturb or damage the habitat of a great crested newt, again, unless licensed to do so. What this means that is because of the protection that the species have, newts are also protected from development and developers cannot go ahead in an area where great crested newts are present unless they have a license. Under the traditional licensing approach, developers would um, apply for a survey and they would survey their development area for great crested newts. If they were found to be present, then mitigation would need to be put in place for that population. Typically, this mitigation would be either creating a different habitat on the same site for the newts or creating a different habitat in the nearby local area for newts. They would then translocate any of the individuals in the development area um, and that would be the end of the story. Um, what Natural England discovered was that the resource to undertake the surveys and the translocations were huge and the amount of money coming in from developers was mostly being spent on surveys and translocations rather than the habitat creation. And the figure they came out with was that it was seven to one, the amount of money being spent on surveys compared to habitat creation. This meant that habitat, co habitat creation was concentrated on a really local scale, um, which unfortunately meant that on a landscape scale, losses were still occurring and great crested newt populations were still declining despite this mitigation. Um, that's when Natural England decided to launch a new scheme called district level licensing. Um, and what I have got now is another video that Dan is going to share with you all um, that explains the district level licensing scheme in great detail. Land use change over the last 100 years or so has led to a decline in ponds by about 50 to 70 percent across the landscape. And this has had an impact on lots of species, but in particular the grey crested new. Great crested newts are amphibians. They spend part of their lives in ponds. So they use ponds in the spring and early summer for breeding and then the adults leave the ponds and hibernate on the land. So in woodlands, grassland, scrub areas, which are really important for the populations. In the UK, the great crested newt populations are significantly important internationally. And for this reason, they're protected legally. And in England, you need a license from Natural England to affect any habitat or the newts themselves. So any developer wanting to undertake a development requires a license from Natural England. In order to achieve this license, they need to undertake a lot of site survey, they need to develop a mitigation strategy to demonstrate how they will manage the newts during the development. And that involves quite a lengthy process and can be quite time consuming, very costly, and it's quite difficult to find a solution which is best for the newts and best for the development. So there was a feeling that we needed to do better and should try and do better. And so we came up with the concept of district level licensing for great crested newts. In order to understand more about great crested newts, we wanted to create some models and some maps to understand where they are across the country. To do that, we went out, we surveyed over 7,000 ponds using environmental DNA, eDNA, and those results were fed into our models and they are what help us understand where the newts are. We could use this model to create maps describing risk zones, i.e. the areas where developments are most likely to impact newts, and also maps called strategic opportunity areas, which describe the best places to put ponds to benefit newts. Natural England established habitat delivery partnerships with uh, wildlife trusts, farming and wildlife advisory groups, and local authority countryside management partnerships, and they connected with landowners who were keen to restore and create ponds on their landholdings. We've been so lucky to work with amazing partners and landowners who understand the importance of balancing agricultural production and restoring the landscape for wildlife. Creation of ponds is almost always one of the first opportunities when restoring land for wildlife. Our experience suggests that landowners get a lot back from the ponds that they create. When we bought the property, the plan was really to uh, make it more environmentally sound. I approached Natural England the process was very simple. Excavators, cost of the driver, everything thrown in, 100%. It all happened very, very quickly. I think it was probably less than three or four weeks. I think it's the, the most simple process. It would be lovely to see great crested newts here. I can't see anything other than positives in this. 
Given this pond has been in for sort of 18 months, so it's had its first eDNA analysis, it wouldn't surprise me in the slightest if this pond has great crested newts in it. Everything stacks up for it. It's a great pond, it's got the connections, we're a pond in the surrounding landscape, so I wouldn't be at all surprised with this one if it, if it held great crested newts. I think the district level licence scheme really offers a collective approach. There's numerous stakeholders involved and essentially it's about producing tangible benefits for the species. The district level licensing scheme is available in most areas of England. It's facilitated hundreds of developments and generates millions of pounds per year. 85% of this funding goes towards habitat creation, monitoring and maintenance. District level licensing is about moving beyond species protection towards nature recovery. We're now seeking to create and restore around a thousand ponds per year and we think this makes us the largest pond creation and restoration project in Europe, possibly the world. We just want to say thank you to all the fantastic landowners that are working with us. Brilliant. Um, so that video just is a really nice summary of the scheme um, and they explain it a lot better than I probably could. OK, so um, as the video says, Strategic Opportunity Areas, SOAs for short, have been modelled to show suitable habitat for Great Crested Newts. And these are the areas that we target for new ponds to go into. Um, so Strategic Opportunity Areas are split into core and fringe, and we can put ponds into either of those areas every year. Um, under district level licensing, landowners can apply to have up to six ponds created or restored on their land. Um, but these ponds must meet specific requirements. Before I tell you about the specific requirements, I would just like to show you another short video, the last video for today, um, which shows strategic opportunity areas and how they have been modelled. Species distribution models are a, a fundamental component of district level licensing. Their aim is to predict the suitable habitat for a species, in this case, great crested newts. And we do that based on our understanding of the ecology of the species and thinking about the positive and negative habitat features for that species in an area. We know great crested newts like areas with woodland and grassland for hibernation and foraging and shelter. They also need lots of ponds, preferably with a neutral pH. Equally, great crested newts don't like areas with sandy soils, areas with high urban density or high arable density. They also don't like salt marshes. And this will let us understand where we're likely to find newts and where we're unlikely to find newts. The important thing about every data set that we put into a species distribution model is that the model is only as good as the data we put into it. And therefore, particularly in terms of observations, we want as many observations as possible. So we've been out as Natural England and surveyed thousands of sites across the country, but we also then go off to the local record centres, we go to amphibian and reptile groups, and we go to individual local stakeholders and ask for their data as well. And all of that feeds into creating a better model. One of the important factors when we're creating species distribution models is that every region is slightly different. The Lake District has its mountains. Norfolk, Suffolk is very flat, and therefore, what we need to do is incorporate different habitat features for each of those different areas and therefore we create a different model for each region and that's how we hope to create a better model more representative of the newts in that area. There are many different ways of creating a species distribution model. They're all based on different quite technical statistical methodologies. What we do at Natural England is we create lots of different models based on these different statistical approaches and we collate the predictions of those all together to create what we call an ensemble model. Ensemble models are quite similar to the way that actually weather mapping and modelling is done uh, for the weather forecast. And therefore, by having these ensemble models, which incorporate lots of different methodologies, we hope that we're getting more consistent results and hopefully more performance from the models themselves. From our ensemble models, we create predictions of habitat suitability for great crested newts across an entire region. We predict based on a, a grid square of 25 metres by 25 metres, so it's very fine resolution. From those predictions, we can then use them for multiple other reasons. The first thing we can do is we can look at the ability of a species to disperse across their habitat. And we do that using a process called least cost paths. 
and we look at the ability of an individual newt effectively to disperse across that environment. So if it's unsuitable habitat, it finds it difficult. If it's suitable, it finds it easier. And then we include barriers like roads, rivers, urban areas. The next stage is that we create our risk zone maps. And risk zone maps are there to understand the different compensation payments that developers will have to pay if they want to go through district level license. There are four main zones. There's a white zone, a green zone, amber zone, and a red zone. White zones are where we don't expect Great Crescent Newts to be at all, tops of mountains, for example. Green zones, where we don't predict there to be very suitable habitat. Amber zones, where we do predict there to be suitable habitat for Great Crested Newts. And then the red zones. And red zones are specific areas where there are key populations. They may be internationally recognised, nationally recognised, or locally recognised. And they can be set up by the stakeholders themselves to help us with that process. The final maps that we produce are where are the best places to put ponds to benefit great crested newts across the entire landscape. And the way we do that is via our strategic opportunity areas, or what we call the SOAs. These are maps that identify core and fringe areas where if we place ponds, we hope to increase the distribution or the population of newts. Core areas are where we already expect there to be newts and where there's suitable habitat. And if we place ponds in those areas, what we're going to find is hopefully an increase in the population. In the fringe areas are areas which are areas around the core areas. Those areas will hopefully have suitable habitat in terms of terrestrial habitat, but probably not have very many ponds. So by placing ponds in, we hope that the newts will disperse from the core areas into those fringe areas and increase the population of newts across the region. So we've undertaken to update all of those regional models every five years. And the reason we want to update them is because we get better information over time. For example, we'll have new land classification maps which detail where urban areas are and urban sprawl compared to where arable areas are expanding, for example. And we can incorporate that data into our models and refresh the models so we have a more accurate model over time. Also, there's potentially new modelling methodologies that will come along which may be better suited to predicting where great crested newts are and therefore we would want to adopt those as well. Species distribution modelling, from my perspective, is about improving the status of great crested newts across the entire landscape. We want to encourage developers to engage. We want to encourage habitat delivery bodies to put the ponds in the right places and our modelling approach enables us to do that. Perfect. I'm just going to um, share my screen again. Okay, lovely. Um, so in that video, um, they explain the core and fringe areas. And if anybody is interested in having a look at those areas, you can do so um, online. So they're publicly available on Magic Maps. So you just have to go to the Magic Map website um, and then there's a list of um, drop down boxes that you can tick on the left hand side and um, the first one you tick is land based schemes then you go down to other schemes and then you have a selection box for the SOAs and um, so anyone can go on and have a look and you can see if your land is within car fringe or outside of an SOA and currently there's quite a lot of areas that are car and fringe but there's also a lot of areas in the UK that are outside of an SOA but over time, the more ponds we put in, we would expect fringe areas to become core areas and the areas outside of the SOA to become fringe. So over time, in an ideal world, we'd have a full map of the UK that was either pink or green with no white, because white represents outside of an SOA. Um, so as I said earlier, landowners can apply to have up to six ponds created or restored on their land. Um, restorations are a bit tricky because some ponds that may not look in fantastic condition are still able of supporting a new, li a new life cycle and so they're not eligible for restoration. 
Um, so when we're doing restorations, it can be a little bit tricky. But generally, if a pond is heavily silted up or it's dried up and it's not looking like it's going to hold water, then they may be eligible. Ponds that are slightly clogged up with vegetation but still have areas of open water will not qualify. And that's because if there's any areas of, of open water, then the pond is still capable of supporting a new life cycle. Um, so if you think you have a pond that's in need of restoration, the best thing to do is to take some photos and then get in touch with your local habitat delivery body. Um, for ponds to be created, they have to meet the specific requirements of the district level licensing scheme. <clears throat> Um, so on this slide, it lists all the different requirements that we ask for, and it seems like quite a lot, but um, it's actually quite simple. I mean, the basis of us creating a pond is just we dig a hole, we let water fill it naturally, and then we let plants naturally colonise it. So it really is a simple process. But what we ask is that the pond is a minimum of 150 metres squared, and um, it has a maximum central depth of one metre. On the larger side, a pond can be at a maximum of a thousand meters squared. And if the pond is on the larger side, it can have a maximum central depth of 3.5. Um, we always ask that there's a range of depths across the pond. And we always ask that the bank gradients are at variable slopes. Um, this is to give Great Crested Newts and other wildlife an easy way to access the water and to exit the water and the range of depths mean that there's going to be open water for newts to do their courtship behaviour. Um, we like good water quality um, so we put our ponds in areas where there's an eligible runoff from agriculture and from roads and in areas where the pond is at risk from being poached from livestock then we would fence it. Um, as the videos have discussed, we don't want ponds in isolation, we want ponds in clusters. So if um, you already have a pond on site, we'd be more than happy to put another pond in. If you didn't have a pond on site, then we'd probably be looking at doing a minimum of two, um, because ideally we want ponds to be within 250 metres of each other. And then the last requirement that we ask is that there is a terrestrial buffer zone of at least three metres around each pond. And this is really important for when newts leave the pond in autumn and start living and feeding terrestrially. And it's also really important uh, uh, during winter when they hibernate. Another thing that we ask for in that terrestrial buffer zone is one hibernaculum. So a hibernaculum is, an, is a man-made feature created for newts to hibernate in. Generally, it can be a pile of logs or a pile of stones covered with dirt and then it's allowed to grass over and it just means that there's somewhere with lots of little holes that the newts can crawl into in the winter. Um, this image basically shows what I've just been through so it sounds like quite a lot but really it's just making sure you're digging a hole and making sure you get in those sloped edges and different depths without going too deep. In addition to this um, we do have some long term goals that we would like ponds to meet. And um, so the first one is we want our ponds to have submerged and marginal vegetation. We don't recommend um, buying plants and planting them because this often can in introduce invasive species. And um, so what we but what we do ask is that you leave the pond to colonize naturally and eventually you will start getting um, both submerged and marginal vegetation appearing. Um, we ask that ponds aren't shaded on their south side. So if we are choosing a pond location, we will purposely not choose a location where there's lots of trees on the south. Um, and we ask that if you're planning on doing planting, you always make sure you're keeping that south side clear. Um, a few trees are OK, especially if pruning can be done. But ideally, that south side will be pretty clear. Um, one of the main features of the pond for newts is that there's an abundance of invertebrate prey. And to maximize that, we ask that fish are not introduced and waterfowl are not encouraged. Um, fish and waterfowl are both very good at eating lots of things. And not only will they eat the invertebrate prey, but they'll also eat young amphibians. Um, so 
in Lancashire, the Lancashire Wildlife Trust is the habitat delivery body for the district level licensing scheme. The scheme is not available in every county in the UK, but it is available in quite a few. Um, and if you're unsure of your habitat delivery body, you can get in touch with me and I can point you, you in the right direction. And um, so the scheme started in Lancashire in 2019 and up until um, spring this year. So before I joined the project, 130 ponds have been created and 49 ponds have been restored, which is quite a significant number for what a four year period. Um, in 2023, our forecast is to do 25 creations and five restorations. So because developers put money into the district level licensing scheme, the number of ponds created each year depends largely on the need for ponds from developers. And um, so developers can still use the old scheme. They do not have to use the district level licensing scheme, so they have a choice. So the more developers that want to come into the DLL scheme, the more ponds that we need to create in the county. So for this year, we're looking at approximately 30 ponds in Lancashire. And at the moment, we're on track to meet that target. Next year, again, depending upon developer needs, it will depend upon how many ponds we put in. Um, so to finish, I just wanted to show you some of the ponds that we've done so far. Um, and just discuss them a little bit. So all of the ponds that we put in are, are basically just a hole dug in the ground and left. Um, we tend not to use liners where possible because liners need maintenance and we're hoping to have ponds that are low maintenance where possible. Um, so we'll go in, we'll dig the hole, we'll then let natural water fill it. So rainwater, groundwater, etc and um, hopefully it will stay full a lot of the time we put ponds in on clay soil and clay soil is fantastic at holding water um, and then eventually over time plants will start to grow in the pond area so on the left you can see a pond this pond was relatively new when this photo was taken so it doesn't have a lot of emergent or submerged vegetation but you can see it's got fantastic scrub around the outside and that is one of the things that is key for great crested newts and um, so that's always really good to see and then on the right hand side you can see a pond that's been in a little bit longer and you can see all of that vegetation that's just started to naturally grow um, and at the moment it's got a really nice level of coverage we would like to see more vegetation but it's a really good start um, on these two ponds they're both quite wildly different so on the right you have a pond on farmland um, this pond was at risk of being heavily poached because there was a large number of cattle and sheep that may use the field, so that has been fenced. Um, if a pond's ever at risk of poaching, we will fence it. Um, similarly, if a pond is going in on council land and it's at risk of a lot of disturbance from dogs, we may put up a fence around it to prevent dogs getting access to the pond. And that's just because the more animals going into the pond, the more they're going to churn up the bottom and just create lots of silt. On the left hand side in this photo, you can see a pond. It doesn't look particularly um, attractive, but it's in fantastic habitat. It's surrounded by woodland, scrub. So that terrestrial habitat is fantastic for newts. The pond itself um, doesn't have a huge amount of vegetation, but over time that will start to build up. Um, and then lastly, these are two of my favourite ponds. So these are both at Brockles, which is one of Lancashire Wildlife Trust nature reserves. Um, and they are at different ages. So on the left, we have an older pond, on the right, a younger pond. And you can see you've got that beautiful scrub around them. You've got the vegetation starting to grow in pond, and that's fantastic. Um, so in terms of who can join the district level licensing scheme, it's basically anyone with land, as long as they are either in core or fringe areas, and as long as the land is suitable for a pond. So if you've got a lot of sandy soil, it might be really difficult. So far, we have put ponds into our nature reserves. We've put ponds into council amenity land. We've put ponds in small little patches of land that have been unused for a long time. 
we've put a lot of ponds in fields owned by farmers and ponds in people's back gardens if they've got big enough space. So it really is a scheme that can um, be used by anyone and the scheme itself is quite straightforward. Um, so that's all I had to say on district level licensing today. If you do live in Lancashire and you're interested in having a pond, <clears throat> then that's my email address and you can get in touch. If you live with, outside of Lancashire, <clears throat> then you can still pop me an email and I can put you in touch with the relevant habitat delivery body. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rachel. That was a brilliant talk. And thanks everyone for bearing with us um, with the pauses around getting the videos going, but hopefully you all really enjoyed that. Um, we have had a couple of questions uh, through the chat to get us started, Rachel. So um, firstly, Caroline asked if an area floods regularly, would that qualify for a new pond under this scheme? Um, so as part of the modelling that they do to identify core and fringe areas, they do take flooding into account. Um, if an area is going to flood heavily each year, then normally it will end up falling outside of a core or a fringe area. And that's just because we're flooding. Um, a lot of the time you might bring fish in or you might bring um, dirty water in. So it's not ideal. Um, so it really does depend on the amount of floods, but the best thing to do is to go to Magic Maps and that will show you if the area is within core or fringe. Thanks, Rachel. Um, a second question we have had through to the chat is, uh, how do you account for enriched soils and common or widespread species outcompeting the marginals? It's a tricky one. Um, so as part of the district level licensing scheme, the all of the ponds have a 25 year plan where they are managed by Natural England. And um, so we do a three month post development check to see how the pond's getting on. And then for the next four years, we visit the ponds to do habitat suitability indexes and eDNA testing that allows us to identify any issues with the pond and any maintenance that needs to be carried out. And then in years eight, 15 and 25, we plan to carry out any necessary maintenance. So that might be removing a certain species that is prolific um, or a number of things. At the moment, because the scheme's so new, we're still developing what that maintenance will look like. But I would imagine that um, that's where we'd start looking at the common species that might be out competing and deciding what to do. Thank you. Um, Andrew has also asked, um, does the district level licensing scheme align well to the requirements of biodiversity net gain? Um, for example, the 30 year habitat management Oh, biodiversity net gain. How did I know that would come up? Um, <clears throat> to be honest, I don't know a lot about biodiversity net gain. So that is a question that I can't answer. And um, what I would recommend is probably getting in touch with Natural England, as they'll be a better place to answer that question. Okay, thanks, Rachel. Um, yeah, um, hopefully you can take note of that, Andrew, and contact Natural England. Um, I wondered, um, do you have a rough idea from the ponds that uh, have been created so far? Is there kind of a, a normal amount of time that it takes for, for the newts to arrive following creation or does it really, really vary? It varies. Um, you would expect um, ponds in the core area to colonise quickly because the core area is where we know there's already newts and uh, there's lots of ponds within that area. But it doesn't always work that way. Newts tend to do um, the unexpected. So they show up in weird and wonderful places, great crested newts. Um, so it really just depends. Um, with the eDNA testing, we do have quite a good idea of 
whether they're there or not. Um, and some years, <clears throat> some ponds will show presence of great crested newt within six months. Other ponds haven't shown presence for two or three years. It just it varies wildly. Thanks. Yeah, I imagined it. Um sounds like a simple question, but I didn't expect it to have a um, <laughs> simple answer, but thank you. Um, we just had another question from Sarah in the chat asking, um, what time of year would you carry out pond restoration? Um, <clears throat> pond restoration is always done in autumn. So after the amphibian breeding season has finished and normally after ground nesting bird season has finished. So we tend to start, um, Dep again, depending on the year, maybe the end of September, and we'll try and go through uh, winter. But as soon as the ground gets too wet for the machinery, that's when we'd look at stopping. Creations can be carried out any time of the year. We just have to be careful with ground nesting birds, depending on the site. Um, but generally, a creation can go in at any time. Thank you. Um, if anybody else has any further questions, um, we have still got a few minutes, so you're welcome to pop them into the chat, or um, if you prefer to, you can um, just raise your hand on Zoom or kind of unmute and, and signal to us that you'd like to ask, and that, that's fine as well. One of the questions that I get lot, asked a lot by landowners is how the plants are going to arrive, um, because it seems unusual to have a field and then suddenly dig a hole and have all of these pond plants pop up um, and it's actually quite amazing because a lot of a huge number of our ponds have been lost um, in the last 100 years say so I think the current figures show an 80 percent decline in ponds in the UK which is quite outstanding um, but what we have found recently through several different projects is that pond plants are able to reappear after a couple of hundred years. So there's a project by um, in Norfolk called the Norfolk Ponds Project. And if you're interested in ghost ponds, that's fascinating. Um, because what they're finding is that they'll dig a hole either where a pond has previously been or nearby to where a pond has previously been. And they'll have species of plants popping up within six months, within a year, and they may be plants that haven't been in the area for, say, 150 years. So it's quite remarkable. So in a lot of farmers' fields, we find that um, we'll dig a pond and then all these weird and wonderful plant species will pop up after the first year. And it's it's just really nice to see. That's amazing. Um, we've just had um, a couple more questions through um, another one from Andrew asking, do you work with farmers around the restoration of field ponds? And how much does historic mapping get used in restoring lost ponds? Um, so we do work with farmers. We're always interested um, to look at restoring field ponds. We are developing um, a volunteering role at the moment, which is mapping out ghost ponds. So ghost ponds is what we call a pond that would would have been there historically and then over time it's either got um, filled in by a farmer or filled in for whatever reason. Um, and it's a case of looking through historic maps, finding every single historic pond in the area, finding out what's still there and what's gone. And um, so again, the Norfolk Ponds Project have already done this. And the idea is eventually with district level licensing, we're going to get so many ponds created that we'll run out of places to put them. And the only way to keep putting new ponds in is to restore all of these old ghost ponds. So at the moment, Lancashire Wildlife Trust are looking to recruit several volunteers who will go through loads of historic maps and map out all of these ponds. And then we'll specifically target those areas in years to come. And they're the ponds where well, we should start seeing some really interesting plant species returning and um, so i'm really excited about that but we haven't quite started on our ghost pond part of the project just yet amazing um in case anyone hasn't seen dan has also just popped a link into the chat uh to a web page to um read more about ghost ponds um 
On to our next question, uh, Peter has asked, have you ever made a licensed introduction of great crested newts uh, to one of these pond creation sites? Um, to my knowledge, we have not. Um, what we're hoping to achieve with the district level licensing sc scheme is natural movement of newts. Um, and if we start um, carrying out translocations or reintroductions, um, it just confuses the data. So most of the ponds, in fact, all of the ponds that I'm aware of have been left so that the newts naturally find their way there. Thank you. Um, Michelle has uh, asked, sorry for the dim question. I don't think it's a dim question, Michelle, um, but do landowners therefore get payment um, for creation or restoration of ponds for great crested newts? Yes, so um, the scheme is fully funded by Natural England. Um, so all of the either creation or restoration works are covered by the grant, including any fencing that is required. Um, and then it does vary slightly between habitat delivery bodies, but most also have a small landowner incentive. So if you have either two or more ponds created or restored on your land, then you do also get a cash payment. Thank you. Um, Chris has also asked, um, well said, we have great crested newt ponds on municipal land that have regular dog access. Um, so is there an obligation to fence existing ponds? Um, it's a tricky one because it depends on how much access the dogs have and how regularly dogs are going in and disturbing the ponds. Um, if it's a daily occurrence and it's happening um, regularly throughout the day, then our recommendation would be to have the pond fenced. Um, under the district level licensing scheme, we wouldn't go and fence existing ponds, but for any pond that we're creating or restoring, we take into consideration the access around it and we fence it where necessary. Thank you, yeah, that's good um, advice. Um, we probably have time for one more question if anyone um, does have one they'd like to pop into the chat. Um, but in the meantime, I was gonna ask Rachel, is there, um, well, what would you recommend to people who maybe um, are here you know, out of interest and are enthusiastic about supporting, but um, maybe don't have a pond um, um, of their own or land to kind of um, introduce one on it. What's the best way to kind of follow the work and support it and get involved? Um, again, because we're quite new, although we've been going for a few years now, it is still quite a new scheme. And um, so we are in the process of developing our um, social media and our website stuff, etc. Um, so at the moment, to support the scheme, I'm not too sure. I mean, Natural England do most of the publicity around it, but in Lancashire, we will very shortly be um, doing a big push online with our website, uh, with our newsletter, etc., to get more interest in the scheme. So I guess the best way to support us is to um, get in touch with your habitat delivery body. If you think you know of any ghost ponds in your area, you can send that information through. I had a gentleman last week send me some really interesting information about um, some ghost ponds he was aware of. Um, if you have a piece of municipal land and you think, oh, this would be a fantastic place for a pond, then you can get in touch um, and let us know who your council is. Um, or if you, basically just tell people about the scheme. It's still relatively new and a lot of landowners aren't aware it's available. So the more you talk about the scheme, the more people will know. 